and we're back. Yeah, I'll record it. I'll record the rest of it. <laughs> okay. So um, <clears throat> the identity portion of it, what's it like to be from this place that my accent's from? What's it like to have lived that life, right? What's, you know, and, and this can be almost anything. We, we, can, we can say things like, um, you know, what's family life like there? What's religious life like? What's it like to be a sports fan? What's it like to be a foodie in that place? What's it like to, 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 et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> this is where we can draw on our own selves. I'm a sports fan, right? And so like any accent I learn, it's from a different place that I don't know enough about yet. I want to find out, for instance, okay, so I'm, you know, an American football the Denver Broncos are my team. So I'm like, okay, who are the Denver Broncos of, you know, if I was learning a British accent, who are the Denver Broncos of Premier League rugby? And I'd want to just find that out. Something I can connect to on a personal level that I already know something about. Find those correlations from my own experience that I can connect with personally. So we start with people. And again, this is the most important thing because unless we can imagine ourselves as a native speaker of our target accent, we're going to be separate from it never able to enter in fully owning it as a native speaker, like we own our own accents in real life, all right? So we have to start with that. So people, second, posture, all right? This is the physical makeup of an accent, all right? This is, you know, um, if you work with me, you'll hear a lot about vocal tract posture, the habitual settings of tension, release, and alignment in these body parts that are responsible for the shaping of accents in our speech. Right, so we have to learn how to control all this stuff and get it to do what we want, get it strong and flexible. I often say we got to take your face to the gym. You know, we got to get it some CrossFit and some yoga. It's got to be in some dance classes. So it needs ballet, modern, jazz, tap, ballroom, because it has to be able to do all the choreography it's going to run into in any accent. Right. So the posture stuff. So what's the sort of alignment and makeup physically of the accent? And why is this important? Because you cannot listen to yourself do an accent and act at the same time. However, you can feel an accent while acting because these are body parts and you can feel them. You can be aware of where they are, how they're moving, what they feel like in the same way you know what these body parts are doing when you're acting, All right? No different really. Um, so that's people, posture. The third one, this is probably a new word for most everybody. Prosody. This is a fancy linguistic term that means the music of an accent. All right. Think pitch, rate, volume, connectivity, you know, how things are smushed together or separated. Uh, how do we deal with syllabic stress? You know, there's variations on that in languages. You know, I was working on an Italian accent with an actor for an audition yesterday. And we were talking about syllabic stress is different in Italian than it is in English. Italian is what we call a syllable timed language, meaning that all of these stressed syllables in that language are relatively the same length. English is a stress timed language, meaning that the space in between all the stressed syllables is relatively the same length. Right. And we have to understand that because if I'm an Italian speaker speaking English, it's not uncommon for me then to want to enforce the Italian language's syllabic stress and other you know, forms of prosody into English. And this is why things begin to sound the way they sound in an accent. Right. So the music of an accent, we could have all of the physical stuff uh, and everything down in an accent. And if we're missing the prosody, people will go, well, you sound Italian, but you don't really sound Italian. I, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. An audience and a director and, you know, you know, whoever's working with that accent, you know, from the outside, they'll know something feels a little off, but they will never be able to put their finger on how or why. Prosody is so deeply embedded into like our subtext and just our desire to communicate under the surface that we're not often aware of what we do with it. It's just like there. And uh, once you start to see it and hear it, you can't unsee it and unhear it. And so we have to sort of bring that up into your awareness. But just now, like, that's a really crucial element for accent. And then last but not least, the fourth P, pronunciation. It's last. Because it's actually the least important part. How many of you 
have ever tried to learn an accent by saying, all right, let me see how things are just pronounced and we'll start there. Okay, almost everybody in the world has started accent learning that way. And it's not, it's not for a wrong reason, all right? Your instincts are like guiding you somewhere. And it's because the sounds of an accent are actually the most noticeable things right away of an accent, how stuff is pronounced differently, all right? But the sounds themselves, that's the most superficial level of the accent, right? The other stuff undergirds the pronunciation so that pronunciation can be possible. Without this other stuff, without people, posture, and prosody, pronunciation is actually just floating on its own. It's never connected to anything real. And it is liable to be really, really inconsistent and difficult. Because you have to micromanage the sounds when you're starting with pronunciation. If you start with the other thing, by the time you get to pronunciation, it's likely that a number of the sounds, and by number I mean like a lot of them, are going to kind of take care of themselves simply through our work in terms of the posture and the music of the accent. There's always going to be a handful, three, four, five, six sounds that don't really line up. And that's just because our accents are always here, present, going, hey, I'm here. You know, we could just use me. Wouldn't that be easier? We do that all day. We, you know, I'm just going to creep in here and pronounce this one word for you and then leave. Right. So our, our accents are always here. So there's always going to be some influence from the way we speak in real life. Right. Um, that's fine. But we can handle three, four, five, six sounds that we can tinker with and build new muscle memory for. All right. We can absolutely do that. And we don't have to micromanage all, you know, 28 plus vowel sounds and 17 consonant sounds that are possible typically in English. That's impossible. You couldn't do that on act. I guarantee you couldn't do it. You can do one thing or the other. You can either micromanage the accent or act. Can't do both, right? So being able to break an accent into its component pieces, that's really, really useful for us because then we know what to do so we can do that accent. And then we just work, work it out. We drill the living crap out of it. Was it's anybody- no muscle memory. Again? Was anybody here surprised that pronunciation came last in the list? Few people, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting to see. It's you know, it's such. It's almost the opposite of how a lot of drama schools and a lot of people kind of think that an accent should be done. Mm -hmm. You know, it is exactly the opposite of how it's taught in most drama schools, um, and that's largely because the way that dra in drama schools, uh, you know, the teachers in those areas, you know, they're teaching frankly older techniques you know, ways that we don't teach currently in film and television in particular. Um, and those training methods have just never been updated, right? And then a new teacher comes in and, you know, occasionally something gets updated for sure. But it, in large part, it's just, it's always been taught this way. It's the, the way that way in the UK, it's that way here in the States. And, you know, we can change that. We don't have to be trained in those ways. And you know, we can do the things in a new way that really can, it's geared towards helping you be a better actor, all of this. None of this is useful to you unless it sets you free in your acting. Yeah. None of this. <laughs> yeah, Veronica? Can I just say something? Because uh, talking about this old, how it's taught in an old method, and I feel sometimes that the industry is there are not many opportunities for different accents to be explored. It's very rare that it happens. Usually they require the American accent in, in all its variety and then the English accent or whatever country you are, they will go for those ones. Mm -hmm. How can we, I mean, this is maybe not a question for you, but it's just like a questioning in general. Yeah. How can we expect or be the vehicle to change that idea? You know, that ah. we are worth it as well. Do you see what I mean? All the different accents. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So wonderfully right now in Hollywood in particular, in film and television, we are entering kind of a renaissance, if you will, in diversity. So diversity of storytelling, diversity of casting, diversity in accent and language. And the streaming platforms have really skyrocketed this into possibility because there's just a ton of content now that's being produced worldwide. And so the audience has grown substantially. And so the content is going to adapt to however many audiences that we have. It's going to be geared towards that. So I would say if you keep working at your accent flexibility, right, keep leaning into your own accent in daily life, 
and doing as much work and acting with that as possible as well, right? You're, you're gonna start to touch these different areas of expanded diversity. In addition, you know, you, you guys as actors are gonna spend a lot of time in this business waiting around for people to give you work. Can't do that. <laughs> Cannot sit around waiting for somebody to hand you a job, all right? You guys have to be content creators. You guys have to, you have to write, you have to act, you have to produce, you have to direct. You create your own shorts, create a feature film, create a web series, do things on your own, make good art. Make good art that people are going to want to watch and going to want to see. Make good art, right? And always be creating, A, B, C. Always, right? There should never be a time in your life where you're not working on a project of some sort. There's going to be times in between auditions, sometimes months in between auditions, sometimes years in between bookings from your agents, all right? That's possible too. Like you could have a string of like six months, I'm working all the time, and then crickets for two years, all right? That's possible. And in, if, if in those two years, you're not like creating three web series and I wrote a short film and produced it and directed it, started it, submitted it to festivals. I, you know, redid all my acting clips for my casting profiles. I've got a new reel. I did a voiceover demo. If, that, if all of that has not happened, you've wasted two years waiting for somebody to give you a job. So the only way to change the business is to be a part of the business. And so that means being a part of it and being active and making your own content. And I guarantee if you're committed to making art that you're passionate about, that's high quality, all right? And that you are an exciting collaborator, you know, with the other people, you're gonna build relationships, you're gonna to start to expand. And before you know it, you're gonna have a lot of partners in crime in this business. Right, and a rising tide lifts all boats. Right. I love, I love yeah, that. Um, sorry. Um, I just, I was just reminded when you say about make good art. If anyone hasn't seen it, there is a YouTube clip. If you if if you go onto YouTube and you Google Neil Gaiman, the writer. Uh, if you Google Neil Gaiman make good art, you'll see this wonderful speech he did about ten years ago now, I think really recommended. Daniel, yeah, hi. Yeah, I, I brought a question about um, the placement. It's yeah. a very technical thing, I guess. Well, it is. Um, I learned one of the things that really helped me a lot with a general American accent was, 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 was being told to place the voice at the back of the throat, as opposed to at the front, to, you know, by my lips kind of thing. Mm. So as, as you tour around the States, um, does one tour around one's mouth as well? Yeah, in a way we do. Um, <clears throat> this is interesting you, you bring up placement because I've had three or four conversations about this in the last 10 days with different actors and one yesterday with this actor I was working on with Italian. So um, what is placement of the voice? That's the tricky question. Um, to me, talking about placement, not anywhere near specific enough for us to be able to actually know what we're doing, all right? When we talk about placement, really what we're talking about is the relocation of the resonance of the voice, whether that's body, head resonance, uh, probably a blend of the two, all right? Where that thing is actually going to be located, and it's located in more than one place in every accent in your mouth. There's a primary focus and a secondary focus, things like that, um, but when we talk only about resonance, we're actually leaving out another thing. Resonance and resonance placement is actually downstream of posture. The posture of an accent is what determines the resonance, right? And the reason that resonance and resonance placement is so prevalent in a lot of you know, actors when they talk about accents is because they were likely trained by teachers who had no idea how to talk about actual vocal anatomy and posture in a way that was specific enough to be useful. So we talk about resonance because those are things we can feel. They're tangible, they're real. We can feel them, we can notice them, but it's, it's purely accidental typically that we learn how to just intuit our way through moving resonance, right? We just kind of figure it out, right? And a lot of actors absolutely do that. Um, so it's the posture of an accent that changes. So Daniel, you're absolutely right that in a general American accent, you're going to feel more resonance in the back here because the tongue is lower in an American accent than it is in your accent. 
and your axe at the back in the middle of your dorsum are actually elevated and arched. So you have a tinier little area here for the sound waves to bounce around, but you do have a larger one right behind your teeth. So this is why you experience more resonance in the front of your mouth because you just have a larger resonating chamber. Suddenly we go to an American accent and we have much more space back here. We don't lose the space up front, but we're adding back here as well. Um, in a Texas accent, the tongue's going to be kind of like this. And the soft palate's going to be low, so we get some nasality. So again, we have some resonance back here behind the tongue even, and up here, you know, in the same way that a British accent might. Um, and of course, every accent in America has a slightly different vocal tract posture. And it's going to change how that resonance happens, right? Um, so it's not wrong to feel resonance and to like use that as a guide. It really isn't because it's necessary and we have to be able to feel it. But it's important to understand where it's coming from and why that's happening. Because actually the physical changes of where the tongue is, how it's arched or cupped, what the lips are doing, the jaw positioning, those things are far more concrete than resonance. And they help us way more first. Later, the resonance, I think, is potentially even more useful just because it's a more global kind of experience that once you've nailed down the muscle memory of the posture, you have more access to it. And, um, and then, then we move into the nose because um, like we, you know, we have that to be, there's, a, there's an idea that lots of Americans have a very nasal, uh, but then a vast swathe of Americans don't have nasal. Um, and I was thinking as we were talking, I was just thinking a couple, you know, we've got a valley girl on one side, maybe Reese Witherspoon or something. Now on oh. the other side, you've got, I uh, can't remember the lady's name, Garcia, or the, the Democratic uh, member of Congress, you know, she's the, the, uh, the very left wing one. She, yeah, yeah. she talks a lot out of her, mm -hmm. uh, through her nose as well. Yeah. It, it, is it down to the P, the first P? Yeah, um, it is. Because like we have to start with that first P, the people. So like, you know, people, we, we can, you know, we can sense accent changes and broad trends based on age range and generation. We can, you know, based on education, based on socioeconomic status, based on gender, based on sexual identity and orientation, based on... Uh, you know, whether you have pets or not or allergies or whether you like like all of this stuff impacts accent so th this is one of the reasons why we use real human beings as our accent models right so we find a real person who actually speaks our target accent in real life to use as our model and our guide in accent work because while we can identify broad features of accents right the way this thing actually appears in the real world is going to be different person to person it's gonna be widely different and it's gonna be different for you eventually what we have to do is we have to say okay hey, what's your version of this right veronica who's american veronica what would that be like right it's, yeah we don't know yet but we have to discover that because your unique vocal tract is going to make its own unique version of this accent we we'll use our model but eventually we have to go okay now let's do your version of this Let's find the thing that lives inside you that sings and makes art and is cool and happy and awesome, right? I want to find that. Um, yeah, really, really crucial <laughs> to focus on the individuals in addition to the broad because there is variety. Um, your job as actors is to enact all of human behavior, right? All of it. That includes all speech behavior, all accent behavior. How does speech really occur in the real world? How do accents really occur in the real world? And how do we describe that? That's what I teach in accent skills, by the way. We teach you how to look at it and be able to actually describe it so that you can do it. Our job is not to prescribe a way for you to talk so you can be an actor. Our job is to teach you how to describe actual speech that we can do ourselves in different accents. Brilliant. Brilliant question, Daniel. Thank you for that. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. If anyone has anything else that they wanted to ask Chris or anything like that, do, you know, put your hand up or, or shout out or anything. Oh, yes. Hi, Claire. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I've just got a question about my tongue, using your tongue. I'm very aware that I can't get it in the right place and I spend a lot of time, but I don't really know what I'm doing. So I try and slow down a sound, but yeah, I'm quite aware of mm. my tongue. 
basically. So what would you recommend? Is there anything I can look at or copy or practice? Yeah, yeah. I would recommend working with an accent coach. <laughs> okay. Tr tr truthfully, like this, this is what I would teach you how to, how to, number one, know what the pieces of your tongue are that we're using in great detail. Number two, teach you what, how, how to feel them. So that, because we can't see the tongue, it's inside the mouth. Mm. We have to operate almost exclusively on based on what it feels like. So we have to learn that. So there's a lot of awareness building that I take you through. And then I get to teach you, this is what it's capable of. This is how it moves. And then we get to make it do those things. And we build muscle memory for it so that you are the one in charge of where your tongue goes. You know, ifs, ands, buts about it, right? We never want this stuff to be accidental. We want it to be on purpose, clear, clearly and carefully directed. So if there's a piece of your vocal anatomy, you're just like, oh, this is kind of a mystery, whether this is going to work or not, or how it's going to work. Like, you've got to get training in it, right? Thinking like a lot of actors expect to be, like, be able to go on YouTube and figure it out or something like that. That's that's almost like saying, yeah, I'm just going to go on YouTube and become a black belt in Kung Fu. And this is actually harder than Kung Fu. It's harder. There's more going on. There's more body parts. There's more dexterity and flexibility needed. And when you do Kung Fu, you're not often also asked to be an awesome actor at the same time. You're not asked to express the breadth of human experience while doing Kung Fu. Mouth Kung Fu, that's, yeah, absolutely you are. So, you know, not, not, to, not to be glib or anything, but really coaching is the only way to be taught how to use any of this stuff. All right. Because okay. if, if you would try to intuit your way through it, or you may stumble on some stuff that's true, but it won't be won't be useful long term for you in accent work that's not specific enough linguistically or you know physically or how it ties into the art that you're creating, all of that. All right. Can't learn accents without getting coached. So you got you've got to have this stuff. Um, so I'd recommend recommend working with an accent coach. Now, now let me be clear about this. I don't take for granted that I am the perfect accent coach for everybody. That would be ludicrous for me to think that's the case in this world. All right. Um, I, like I said, I'm happy to meet with you and just have that free consultation. You go to my website um, and we can talk about it. But if you like, if we don't mix or, you know, mesh well, or you're like, ah, maybe there's another coach out there. Like my goal is to make sure that you find a coach who's professional, who's trained, who can help you succeed. So if, you know, if we don't end up meshing, like I, I will definitely recommend some awesome people to you that you may mesh better with. So just know like whatever the case, I want to make sure you get a coach that's on your team long-term, whether that's me or somebody else. Thank you. Much appreciated. Very welcome, Claire. Thanks, Thanks Claire. Appreciate you being here. Um, does anyone else have anything they, they point that that's come up? Wanted to ask Chris while we're here? Is there, a, is there a particular um, dialect, Chris, that you get asked a lot and perhaps conversely a, a, a particular dialect that you think, oh, you know what, I've never coached this? Oh, God. Let me think about that. So I coach, um, I coach a ton of general American accents for actors coming from accents outside of English or languages outside of English, I should say. So general American, I coach a lot. Um, what else? Well, Southern accents. I've been coaching a lot of Arabic accents recently. Um, we're definitely going to see a lot of Russian and Ukrainian accents here in the next six to nine months. Plan on it. So I'm coaching a lot of Russian. Um, is there an accent I haven't coached? Let me think about that. <laughs> Let me think about that. I'm going to have to go through all the continents of the world <laughs> in my mind right now. See if there's a place I haven't coached. For sure, I've never done Mongolian accent. Um, <laughs> um, hey, Raphael, how, how you doing? Pleased to see you here, sir. Hi, Dan. How you doing? Hi, Dan. How you doing? Dan, Dan. Hi, Chris. How you doing? Chris, thanks very much for this. Actually, you touched this subject just briefly a second ago. Uh, Ukrainian and Russian, yeah. We all expect him to, you know, explode it soon. But the question... Uh, to you for me is um, when it comes to accents when it comes to foreign accents uh, we should present accents a, as they sound naturally or as the no you know no offense as the anglo-saxon people think they sound like as they occur in the real world 
Okay. You know, because why I'm asking this question is that I'm, I'm Polish. I'm 100% made in Poland. Yeah. Uh, born and raised in Poland. I, I spent only like 10 years, less than 10 years in the UK. But very often I hear this, Raph, you've got a really good accent, but can you do more Polish accents? Okay. Yeah. So there's a couple of things happening here. Number one. All right. Casting directors, directors, producers, and acting teachers, largely present company accepted, are not accent experts, okay? And people who aren't accent experts aren't accent experts, all right? So there's a lot of context and knowledge that they're sometimes missing, right? And so they have a preconceived notion of what an Eastern European accent ought to sound like, as opposed to what this Polish accent that's real here in the room actually sounds like. Um, for us, our first goal in accent work is accuracy and authenticity. All right, we want to be authentic to how these things are in the real world so that when, you know, a native speaker sees us on the screen, they recognize themselves in that and they feel seen and we can honor their, them and their experience by using their authentic accent. All right, so that's our first goal always. The second goal is, is this version of the accent the most appropriate for this character or this story? Because even if you have a Polish accent, all right, your unique life experience created that Polish accent. The character's unique life experience may have created a slightly different Polish accent, right? And so, you know, one of the things that you, when you work with me, we learn how to figure this stuff out so we can say, all right, as I am learning any new accent, I'm also learning about my accent. All right, because you, your accent, by the way, guys, is the first accent we ever have to learn because it's our starting place. All right, every accent you learn, you learn from yours. If we don't know this accent, our starting place really, really well, we actually don't know how to get from here to any other accent. All right, and in learning this and learning how to travel from here to other accents, we actually begin to learn how to modulate our own accent. All right, so like I speak with a general American accent mostly, but I can modulate it so I sound a little more California or a little more Midwestern, or I can sound like kind of an East Coast, Mid Atlantic, you know, general American, um, you know, general American touched with a little Southern, right? Like I, I can modulate my own accent if I have to. All right, and so we, we kind of want to learn how to do that. So focus on authenticity, all right? Because that is the baseline for anything. If they say, can you sound more Polish, right? You are absolutely well within your rights as an actual Polish person to say, well, I am Polish and this is my native accent. Um, can, you, can you tell me actually, is there anything specific that you're pinging off that you want to hear more of? Because I can modulate my accent to give you, you know, some different options, right? You always kind of want to be a yes and. They say, well, I already am Polish, but like, are, what, do you have any idea? Because I can, I can ping around in a few different directions. I'm not sure what you mean by more Polish, right? And if I know exactly, yeah, Chris, I know exactly. It's just, can you sound more like Borat? Yeah, okay, yeah, fair enough, absolutely. Um, and I will also say this to each and every one of you. You all have the right to absolutely stand up for yourselves in the audition room with casting, with producing, with anybody when it comes to your accent. Okay? Accent discrimination is actually a real thing in this world. I see it all the time and you do not have to put up with it, all right? So if somebody is asking you for something or talking about your accent in a disparaging way, anything like that, you actually, I wanna encourage you, please do stand up for yourselves. If you have a coach on your side, I will actually stand up for you a lot in terms of this especially with producers on film and television, okay? Um, so if they're looking for more Borat, who's not fucking Polish, okay? Like, this stuff drives me a little crazy as a coach. But again, the thing about this casting director, whoever it was, is, doesn't know what they're looking for. They don't have a specific enough idea of what actual Polish accents are or what Eastern European accents are to give you any clue about how to be specific with the damn thing because they don't know anything about it. They're looking for, wait for it, a caricature, which means that they don't have a clear enough idea of the piece of art they're making to give you anything specific to do. Our first hit on any piece of art is always a caricature, always a cliche. 
anything. Your first read through of a script, all of your ideas, cliche, typically. It's through exploration we go down to the deeper level, but they don't know how to do that. So you get to be your own best mentor in that instance and focus on authenticity and being a human and doing the best acting possible. All right. If they don't like your accent, whatever. But if they don't like, but if they can't look away from your acting, that's actually the most important thing. I hope I answered the question. Did I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you did. No, look, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I don't feel fat by Borat. It's just like, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm a foreigner, and you know, I know I don't do not sound like English, and I shouldn't sound like English because I'm not English. I'll never be casted for an English person. But on the other hand, you know, I'm using cliche stereotypes as well. You know, for me, every Italian person speaks like that, and they don't. Yeah, and all not all the French people are speaking like this. Uh, so we know right. that this is just like yeah. this is like just cliche. No, no, well, just like I, at it's, some it's, level, Raphael, it can be. But also, you have to understand, like, however you're modulating your accent, mm -hmm. like, if, if you're, if you're, like, turning up volume on that accent, like, there's decisions to be made about the character you're playing. How good is this person at English? How often do they speak it? When did they learn it? Who did they learn it from? Um, you know. Yeah, they, this is actually, yeah, Chris, this is, this is actually very, very helpful, what you said that always analyze your character because what I understood, maybe prove me wrong, but what I understood is that just analyze your character. And if, if this is a guy, for instance, comes from a labor class, you know, he had, he, he focused his life on working and uh, getting, you know, money to put a food on the table, not on education. So he did not put, you know, to pay so much attention to accent, but when, when is someone who's, you know, cliche again, but more educated, he might just, you know, have better, you know, private teachers and, you know, learn how to exactly. pronounce things. So. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly correct. And, um, you know, and, and again, don't worry about like encountering the cliche at first, because if we say, well, somebody who's better educated might be better at English in these ways. Like, okay, that's, that's definitely cliche, right? Because it doesn't have to be that way. It could be. And it often is that way. But as long as we understand, okay, so I'm entering into this cliche at first. But let me find the reality here. Let me find the truth in this and the nuance and how this thing would actually be put together in real life. Then we have something that's real to base our accent on. Again, that imaginative identity that mm -hmm. we have to wrap our accent in carefully and closely so it's inside that thing, housed in something real. All right, awesome, but you're absolutely- Raphael. Thanks for your question, Raphael. Awesome. Yeah, it's good to see you. Um, just before we wrap up, does anyone else have anything that they want to quickly ask Chris, by the way? Anyone at all? Um, so thank you so much, Chris. It's been absolutely fantastic. If anyone does want to get in contact with you, what is your website again? Yeah, it's dialectcoachchrislang.com. Okay. And just know that there's options for training, private one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, I have accent skills workshops. I won live on Zoom starting on August the 17th. Awesome. I believe I placed it in a time of the day that's convenient for Europeans. <laughs> I think I did. All right. Um, so there's a, it's six weeks long, seven 90-minute sessions. All right. You'll learn some accent skills. We'll start working on an accent. I also have an on-demand pre-recorded version of this workshop that you can take whenever is convenient for you. And uh, lots of options in terms of training. So just know that if you want to know more, pardon me, please do come talk to me on my website, schedule that free consultation. And we'll just chat about sort of what your accent goals are and what your training has been like in the past and where it's been hard and where it's been easy and where we want to kind of help you through this. Because we want to level up your career. That's our biggest goal. Every accent you add expands your casting opportunities. Brilliant. We want more casting opportunities. Thank you so much. Um, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on as always. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. Um, and it's been great. Um, our classes for June, by the way, our call class for June start next week. So do join us for that. Do drop us an email if you want to join us for that. And yeah, see you all very soon. Daniel, anything, anything else you want to say? Yes, uh, they don't start next week. <laughs> they start the week <laughs> after. <laughs> we still got the last May one on Monday, on Monday in the Zoom classes. Then the week after that, which is the eighth, the eighth of May, uh, June, is so we got there's five Wednesdays. Absolute scene. Um, sorry. 
uh, yeah. So uh, yes, I've got nothing to add apart from hi everyone and bye everyone. Thanks for having me, you guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Bye. Thank Good you, job, my friends. All right, gentlemen.